New York City. New York City. Got some questions that I gotta ask, and I hope you can come up with the answers, babe. Yo, what's going on, man? This is a Q&A video. All these questions were sourced on Instagram, so if you want to ask a question, follow me on there, and you'll be able to participate the next time I do one of these. And maybe we'll run into people, and they'll, they'll answer a question or two as well. Let's, let's answer some questions. The question is, is street photography in New York City relatively easier? Well, I got Jacob and Jalen here, two J's. Um, in certain aspects, yes. In certain aspects, no. Um, I would say that shooting street in New York City, the, the city's just so well documented, and it's can be. You, one could say it's harder to stand out and make quality work. You could also say it's easier to walk the streets and be unseen. Um, it depends how you like to photograph. Depends what you like to photograph. Um, but yeah, that would kind of be my general response. Street photography easier in New York. Well, yes. It's the only reason I moved here. <laughs> yeah. Shooting in Florida was so hard, bro. It's just like everyone's in a car. Everyone's in their house. There isn't a lot of places where people are just outside unless it's like an event. So here, there's always everyone, people outside. So you can just find something to take a photo of. But to stand out, that's the hard part. You know, that's where you have to start, you know, learning the masters, be out here every day practicing and everything like that. So yeah. that's a good point. Yeah. Where, you, where in Florida are you from? Fort Pierce. Fort Pierce. Fort Pierce, Florida. A little town in the Treasure Coast. Yeah. There's always something to take photos of, but if you want to document people, New York's the best place to be. I feel like, um, I would say yes, it's relatively easier just because there are 10 million people that live here and on top of all the visitors. Street photography is a, a genre that revolves around people and just the sheer number of people gives you more opportunities. But what Jacob was saying is so true that it's so much harder to stand out because everybody else is making photos here too. So if that's important to you, then it's gonna be harder. That was pure chaos sitting here, like kind of trying to like, bobbing like, and weaving. Like, New York is a great training ground for a street photographer. Yeah. Put you in every different type of situation. Yes. There's Ilya. What's up? No. <laughs> you wanna answer a question? Uh, the question is, do you go out with a theme in mind? Or do you just completely clean slate? Just completely clean slate, I would say. See what I, happens? I just walk around, see see what happens. I mean, I've noticed over the course of time, I, I think any photographer, you notice that themes emerge. Mm -hmm. You know, so maybe you take photos of, you know, individual people, or maybe it's, I don't know, couples or someone with a cigar, whatever the case may be. So I think themes emerge as you go, and then maybe you pay a little bit more attention to that particular type of photo. But in general, when I go out, I, I'm not trying to focus on a specific theme or themes. I think otherwise it's probably quite limiting in the sense that you're walking around and you're, you're trying to remember what themes and trying to find those themes on the street. So I think it's whatever's, whatever's interesting. Yeah. No, I'm the same way. I don't really have like a goal or theme when I go out and shoot. My only goal is to walk as much as I can. And if I see something interesting, don't hesitate. There you go. Themes probably emerge. I haven't really sat down and looked at everything at a hole yet, so I'm sure if I go back down and look at that, it'll probably be there. But does it make sense to limit yourself and, and not take the photo? You should yeah. just take the photo and maybe it's a great photo and it's different from what you normally do. So At the same time, I am envious of people who are very hyper-focused on a theme, so they don't, they're not as lost as I sometimes find myself when I'm just out taking photos. Like, oh, yeah. like it's very dependent on like, oh, I, I didn't really see anything today, yeah. whereas if like, I feel like if you have a theme, if you didn't see anything, it's like, okay, that makes sense because I was looking for this and couldn't find this. If you don't find anything in everything, then it's kind of, you kind of feel lost sometimes. But for me, it's more fun this way. What advice would you give a newbie starting street photography? I think there's probably a bunch of different advice that you could give, but I think one piece of advice is probably just to look at, um, look at the work of others who, uh, you know, work you like or work of, uh, or, you got it? <laughs> or, or work of the uh, kind of big names in, in street photography, a lot of the magnum photographers, etc. Right? There's by lo you know looking at their work and knowing what's out there, it helps you, I think, understand what's been done well. And and you know, if you take a similar photo, is your photo like how does your photo compare to what's been done before you? Yeah. Versus just you know, you take a photo and you think it's an excellent photo, but then you look at what what's been shot before, and there's a bunch of Similar photos that are better than yours. Uh, so, you know, I think that kind of helps um, position the work within the context of what's been done before. That is great advice. Well, I was gonna say something very similar, which is basically 
find out who the matches are and and why. If you pick one and just search why is Alex Webb a master of street photography, and then do that for each of them, and then you'll you'll have a deeper knowledge of what Ilya was saying. The people who shot close, the people who shot layers, the people who shot far, the people who did everything and anything. So yep. thank you, Ilya. Appreciate it. Thank you, Paul. Next questions. Money I got, I, I get money, money I got. Oh, you recording. <laughs> you got me over here fucking <laughs> vibing out to 50. Yo, we got Ribsy here. Ribsy's gonna answer a question. Uh, the question is, does anything enhance your flow or eye in the moment? In the moment. Honestly, I think when I'm out on the streets doing street portraiture, the thing that really like gets me going and puts me in a good state of mind for photography is actually a good conversation. So if I, if I come across somebody and in the moment we just kind of start talking and vibing, especially if it's someone that's visually interesting, immediately I'm like, there's a report, we gotta make a portrait. And it's not always gonna be the best portrait, the greatest thing on earth, but it still puts me in a really good mood and a really good state of mind for doing photography. At that point, they're like a subject, you know, as if I got hired to photograph a celebrity or somebody for an editorial or something. But in the streets, a good conversation for me is everything. Yeah. And I think separate from that, I think it's just vibes. Like if I'm in the street and there's people vibing and laughing and dancing, especially in groups, um, that, you can't beat that. I think I think the vibe is really everything. I think it's the reason why it's so fun to shoot in the summertime and so miserable to shoot in the wintertime. Because in the wintertime, there's nobody out here. Everybody's kind of like sick and tired of being outside. They wear these big ass jackets and they're just like cranky and want to get inside. Uh, and then outside, like as you see right now, it's a beautiful day here. There's like a lot of people out here and it just feels good. Try doing street portraiture in the winter. Like, excuse me, do you, do you want to stop in your tracks right now? I know it's 20 degrees Fahrenheit out, but yeah. I want to take a photo of you. Yeah, how does that conversation go? How does, how does that conversation affect you? In the I, I have tried shooting um, after consuming a gummy, an edible, and I thought it was going to go so well because the, the night before, I, I popped the edible and I was like so concentrated on what I was doing. I was like, bro, if I do this while I'm out shooting, I'm going to be so like in tune with everything. <laughs> And it didn't work. I'm not surprised. I've never, <laughs> I've never heard a good edible story. It did not work. Ninety-nine bro. percent of stories that start with, I took an edible. <laughs> they all end very, very poorly. I thought it was gonna be dope, but it wasn't. Uh -oh, yeah, we're good. Yeah. So, all right, we did. All right, thank you, Ribsy. Appreciate it. You got it. All right. Yeah. yeah so, how many days I go out shooting? I kind of have a. Uh, like my job just puts me out in the city almost every day, so it makes it very easy to then just continue on with my day and shoot. So I'm out probably four days a week, almost three, usually three in Manhattan. And then the other two days, I'm usually somewhere else uh, in the five boroughs. So I'm, almost, I'm in the city basically every day. And I always have my camera with me. So I try to at least take one picture every single day. How many hours, how many hours per day would you say that is? It's dedicated to actual shooting, probably, probably spend like three to four hours. Usually the Manhattan days, I'll, I'll spend more time. For me, I, I would say I'm probably out shooting five to six days a week. Like, so five and a half on average, uh, especially during the summertime. In the wintertime, as we're quickly approaching, that might shrink to like four days a week, especially in January, February. Uh, and then on average, it's probably like six to eight hours per day. So we out here. The next question is, um, what keeps you going out every day to shoot? Which is kind of like related to this question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, for me, again, I guess I could say work, but I thoroughly enjoy coming out. So I purposely schedule my site visits to maximize my time out on the street. I just really enjoy it. It's fun. It's a good, I think it's a great hobby to have. This is active. It's it's good in that sense. So not only do I thoroughly enjoy it, I think it's, it's good for me. It keeps me sharp. I'm always looking around. It's good for my my head and my body, so. Exactly what he said. I just genuinely enjoy doing this. And that's kind of what keeps me out here. That coupled with the fact that like, you kind of have to be out here to get good results. Yeah, that's also true. So like, like to be good at it, you have to be out here and I generally enjoy doing it. So those two things are like, all right, that's a new day. It's a new day to get new photos. Let's, let's see what happens. Uh, anything you wanna say about the Jets? Right now. Let's go Jets. Fuck the Jets. Aaron Rodgers, get healthy uh, as fast as possible, please. <laughs>
Please. Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers did it on purpose because he didn't want to play for the Jets. We're going to the playoffs. <laughs> right, I don't actually believe that. <laughs> I got Rich. I got Rich and Isa here. Isa, I think you can come a little closer. Uh, I'm gonna ask another question. The question is, if you could shadow one photographer from any year in history, who would it be and why? Rich got the mic. Um, for me, I would say Gordon Parks. One, because his work is amazing, it's incredible. But the stuff that he did with Muhammad Ali is one of my favorite, some of my favorite work ever. So I would love to shadow him and yeah, it's just and one. Also, he's black too. So, but I just love the work that he did around that time. So, yeah. I think a benefit of that is you get to be around Muhammad Ali too. You get to be around Muhammad Ali, who I also fucking love. Yeah. You know, but just that work and just seeing how much, just spending time with him yeah. is just so beautiful. I think it's like I would say I feel for like me, his answer, but go on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just sort of blank out. It's Mark Cohen. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I came across that video, you know, over a decade ago, yeah. and um, it just really landed for me. His process, his energy, just sort of how uh, he thinks about photography. Um, I don't know. I, I just felt I was like, yeah. You can tell. He's just got the flash. He's got the flash. Yes, Gary Mark yes. Owen. Got, got, got the flash going. I wake up every day when he's just sending Mark Owen his videos. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Myself, I feel like between it's between two. It's between Walter, sports photographer Walter Yost. I think is how you pronounce his name. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just because, kind of like similar to what what uh, what Rich was saying. Like I get to be around Michael Jordan. I get to be around yeah. Magic Johnson, Muhammad. Like the people you get to be around just from be, picking him would be incredible. And those images are just fantastic. But I think if I really had to choose one for the sole purpose of learning, I'd probably pick Bruce Davidson when he was shooting in Harlem. Oh, yeah. Just because it's like an outsider shooting community that he's not really from. Yeah. And and I'm not, I don't feel like I really belong or, you know, am part of any particular community. So just seeing how he would, how he approached that, how he got into those intimate settings, and just so I could take those learnings and do that for myself, uh, given in any situation. I Anyways, all right, thanks, thanks, fellas, appreciate yes. it. Thank you. Like, do you feel like New York City shoot photographers are all kind of starting to look the same, and do you think everybody's worried about, and are you worried about, kind of the sameness of it all? Uh, yeah, I mean, I feel like it's really difficult to to do something different now. When you start when you start developing a style and like you're looking through pictures and through books and you get obsessed with one book, that's where your inspiration is coming from. Consciously mimicking what you're seeing, but it's gonna come from you naturally because that's what you're studying. But it's so it's so hard. Like every I feel like everyone goes through goes through a period where we sort of copy, but we don't, because it doesn't look exactly the same. It's not the same image. It's just like the basis of street photography. It's like every every image, even if it's like a person smoking, is gonna be a different person smoking at a different time of day. Yeah. Like nothing is exactly the same, although it's similar. So the one thing that I'll say about this question is, um, I use an analogy, I like to use analogies, music. There's only a few chords in history that you can use to make a song, but yet people still come out with new music. Yeah. So like in in that thinking, like we're all kind of shooting similar brands, similar streets, similar styles, but there's always going to be someone new to push the boundaries eventually. Yeah. And it may not be me, it may not be Mariano. Something new will eventually come out. The, the music analogy came from Rick Rubin, by the way. That, that wasn't that original thought. See, that wasn't original. Yeah. So. And if people see the influence, that's okay. I mean, I, I feel like showing where the influence comes from is very important because it's what you study, it's what you're into, what it's like the source of your creativity. Good thoughts, those are good thoughts. Thank you, appreciate it. Bye guys. Yo, what's going on? We got King Japes in the house. This is Jonathan. What's up? Happy Filipino American History Month. Yes, sir. <laughs> Shout out to my Filipinos out there. This is the qu next question that, we're, that Jonathan and I are answering. Is there any cheap digital cameras for street photography? Oh, there's a ton. Get some okay. recommendations. I'm gonna just and give why? you and why and why. Yeah, I'm gonna give you a, a, a sub genre. Ready? Digicams. When people are starting to pick them up, you know they're so small. You can take them everywhere you go. Uh, for street photography, a lot of them have flash, so even if you don't have like an off-camera flash or something like that, you can still use that. There's a shit ton of digicams you can probably get at your local thrift store. What it, what makes 
a good digi cam. Mm. Like what's what separates like a shitty one from like a good one to use on the street? I, I personally like the ones with like lower megapixel count because it gives you that almost like film look when you shoot with flash. When you go for like the higher ones, like a, a 20, meg, 20 megapixel or 24, it starts to look more like the modern day digital. It's a little too sterile, a little too clean. Uh, and you know, for lack of a better word, character, you get more character out of like the older ones. So like the SD-1000 is probably my favorite one. You've got the Canon um, S95, that's another good one. But if it wasn't a Digicam, probably an older Fuji. Yeah, X100S, XE2, XT1. Even like the, uh, this, these are sleepers by the way, the Olympus OMD cameras, the EM5 Mark II, like mm -hmm. one of those. People don't really shoot with it anymore, but you can get them at a good price point and they are one hell of a camera. They're yeah. micro four thirds though, so. Yeah. Uh, I, so going on a different route, I would, and again, cheap is very subjective. Like, right. it really depends on where you're at. Like, cheap to somebody who's like 40 is different than cheap to somebody who's in college. Uh, so, uh, for me, a good cheap option to pick up, and they're kind of, I don't say they're hard to get, but at this point, they're more difficult to get. Just get a Ricoh GR2 or Ricoh GR3. Mm. A GR2 is great because there's a little pop flash, and you can like pop that up and go bang, bang, bang. Um, flash gang. somebody. Bang, bang, Niner Gang. <laughs> but yeah, like a Ricoh GR3, I picked one up like two months ago, and I fucking love it. Uh, it's great. It's like 700, 800 bucks. And you get a good deal on used though. Yeah. Right? And then like, uh, I think they're like 700 bucks used now. Oh, okay. So Maybe 800 bucks to use. But you could also get like a GR2 for a cheaper price. True. Um, and that's, you know, a great camera to start off with. I did a, my whole Philippines uh, zine with a GR2 pretty much. And uh, I, I still like it better than the three, surprisingly. So, definitely. Great. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. <laughs> What's up, y'all? We got we got Jason here, and we're gonna ask another question. What's up, y'all? <laughs> that wasn't good. No, that was good. We're here with another question, Jason. If you don't know him, Grainy Days. The question is, what are you doing with your work besides putting it on social media? I'm not the best person to ask, man. <laughs> Just social media for me. Yeah, uh, I want to do a book. Oh, I'm print. I'm doing prints. Yeah. Um, Book is the big thing, but I, you and I were talking about it. It's it can be a lot trying to put work together in a cohesive kind of thematic way, and uh, it's just an ongoing thing. I'm I'm trying to find that that theme that runs across an entire project like that, and I just haven't. And it's been years, so one day it'll happen, but not today. Yeah. Yeah, I feel that. No, I'm I'm pretty much the same. Like yeah. right now, I'm kind of all of my time and energy is focused on taking the photos, um, and I'm the kind of photographer where I'm not really um, project based. Uh, which you know, maybe in the future I will be, but at this point in time, I'm very much like I enjoy just going out and taking photos without any restrictions, just to find what's yeah. interesting. So letting it pile up and eventually. Um, I can kind of sort those into like a zine, a project, a book. I do want to do a book, uh, similar to what Jason was saying, but a lot of my work is even being shown on social media. That's the thing. I would say like 10% of my work is shown on social media. The other 90% kind of just sits on my hard drive. I mean, how do you share your work then besides YouTube? Do you have a website or anything? No, no. I, so sometimes I'll show, I, I'm around a lot of photographers all, all the time. Sometimes I'll show them like, oh, look at this photo I took. And yeah, but that's like a one-on-one -on -one thing, right? Very one -on -one. How do you get your work out to the masses? I don't know. Just like yeah. YouTube and Instagram. Instagram when I want to, and YouTube when I have to. Yeah. There's not enough like reward or reason to post to Instagram sometimes. It's really more just like, I, I want to put my work out there. You yeah. Know? yeah. Yeah. And sometimes that's all it takes. Yeah. And there's other apps that will try to take Instagram's place. And if they do, I'll hop onto that one. But <laughs> as of right now... It's Sounds just like you have beef against Instagram or something. No, no, no beef. That's right, Zuckerberg. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, Mark Zuckerberg, if you want to sponsor this channel, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> on YouTube, this 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 video is sponsored by. <laughs> Thank you, Jason. Sponsored by the Metaverse. Yeah. <laughs> Appreciate it. Yeah, of course. We got Matt Day here, Father Day. That's what they say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's nighttime. This is our last day, but we're gonna answer this question anyways. Last the question day. is, what photo books? What's your favorite photo book that you've gotten in your collection recently? That was 
too hard of a question for one. So I'm going to cheat and I'm going to give you three and the speed that I would give you one. Okay. Okay. Number one, To Know You Now and Then by Linda Moses. Beautiful book uh, put out by Smog Press. Uh, It's a book sort of on her parents, the way it's sequenced together, the way it's using uh, sort of like past photos of her mom and dad with photos that she shot herself. It's a beautiful book. Uh, County Road by Brian Schutmott. Uh, I'm a big fan of his and County Road looks and feels like me driving around back roads shooting the kind of stuff I like to shoot. And number three, I'm gonna go, it's a book-ish, uh, Polaroid Kid by Mike Brody. Uh, it's a box of reproduced Polaroids and it's completely unique in terms of how it's put together. It's not just your typical book, uh, it's an object itself and it's incredible. The photos are incredible, but also the way it was put together is amazing. I'm gonna say reproduce Polaroids, so they're not the actual Polaroids, obviously, they just made prints Correct. look and kind of feel like a they've, Polaroid. They've scanned the front and the back of each Polaroid that's in this box. They're all loose, there's no set sequence or anything scattered in there there's you know the the dirt and like wear on the polaroids themselves you can see that in the printing you can see handwritten details that he's included whether it was year location that sort of thing uh it just feels like how most people experience polaroids and flip through polaroids just in a scattered box like that yeah Yeah. it's incredible great great answers uh, I guess I should answer now. Maybe. Do you even want to hear from me? I do. <laughs> I do. That's it. I would say uh, I recently picked up Ward 81, Mary Ellen Mark. It was a reprint. Yeah. They reprinted it. But essentially it's like the 70s of a psych ward. Um, but just before it closed and I think they had like 30 something days. It was Mary Ellen Mark and a writer or journalist. Um, they had, and she writes, there's like conversations in it as well that goes along with the photos. And she just takes these intimate photos of these people in the psych ward over the course of like 35 days. That's gotta be a heavy one. Um, and just like, just imagine like photos by Mary, Mary Ellen Mark in a psych ward for 35 days. Telling those vulnerable kind of stories, that's that's her. Like yeah, exactly. no one does it like her, so yeah. Yeah, so check out that book. Hell yeah. I'm gonna add that to my list. Yeah. 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 All right. Thanks, yeah. Matt. Appreciate Thanks, you. Guys. Appreciate you. Yeah. The, the question is very simple. It says, how do you all afford Leicas? Sperm donation. Am I allowed to say that? Is that demonetization no, no, level? that's fine. You got it. No, I mean, I saved up my money. I wanted one. They hold their value, so if I want to sell it, I could sell it. I mean, it's a dumb purchase. Don't get me wrong. But I like it. It's not a dumb purchase. Like, Financially irresponsible, but whatever. <laughs> Conway, how do you afford your Leica? You have point. multiple Leicas. I do. You work for it. How do you make money? You work for it. Really? So. <laughs> Fuji, baby. How do you afford your Fuji? <laughs> same, it's the it. same thing. It's the same. Yeah, right? It's a camera, right? It's I mean, thing. I broke my contacts, so I haven't even been shooting street for that long. I started like last month. Broke my con- well, the contacts broke on me for the second time, and I'm just like, now it's the push to actually go digital. So, yeah. And I already shoot with XT4 for work, so I'm just like, let me just get to this. And shout out to Bozo because he put me up to this flash. And it's kind of been a game changer. So I'm just like, all right, now I'm out here for I have no excuse. Yeah, just work, bro. Just get work. Yeah, that work, get well. money. Yeah, and and decide what you want to spend your money on. Exactly. I bought and sold a lot of Yu-Gi-Oh cards. I bought two different Leicas, and then I sold them for more than I paid for them because the fucking market went up. So you know, be smart with what you buy, and you'll never lose money, and you get to use it for free. Now when they see us in the streets, all they wanna do is take pics, and I'm like, oh.